Somebody shout praise God. So um, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm not preaching through Acts, by the way, just a friendly heads up. But we are going to wade through God's word. Um, my name is Aaron Texter. I am the worship director at Victor Church. Um, you all right if I stand down here? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Come on down. Come on down. Right? We'll get to the preaching part. Give me a second here. So uh, uh, I'm the worship director at Victory Church in Donna Vista. If you don't know where it is, it's between Eustis and Umatilla. So it's not a big county. Figured I'd let you know where it was either way. Um, for the guests, if there's anybody that's never been here before, uh, I'm one of them. Hello, by the way. Uh, I'd like to say hi to anybody that's listening online, whether you're joining live or you're watching later. Welcome. Um, I'd like to honor my pastor, Pastor Toby Cox, uh, who's clearly not here. He's preaching, but hopefully he'll watch later on. Uh, for giving me the week off, let me come here and preach for the staff at Victor Church. I love y'all. Um, thanks for covering for me in my absence. Uh, when you watch this, thank you. Um, I'd also like to honor Moses for giving me the opportunity to come and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, Amen. And y'all for sticking with me through this. So um, y'all are awesome. Praise God for all of them. I am a firm believer in same family, different houses. Um, and it's, it's good to be among friends and family. So, um, thanks for letting me share the gospel. Good news. So I want to start with a couple of things. I want to start by telling you about an engineer that had a sign in front of his office. It said, medical consultations for $50. He said, if I can't make you better, I'll pay you $100. So the doctor from down the road, he said, uh, he says, I know I can stump him. He wants to get some cash, and he goes straight to the engineer, and he says, uh, he says, I've lost my sense of taste. I can't taste food anymore. So the engineer, he takes a small bottle out of his drawer, and he told the doctor to stick out his tongue, and he drops about 15 drops of liquid on his tongue, and he says, uh, he gasped. He says, uh, he says, that's gasoline. Why'd you put gasoline on my tongue? The engineer says, ah, great. Says, Clearly, you've got your sense of taste back. That'll be 50 bucks. You pay to catch you <laughs> so annoyed, the doctor, he goes home, and he says, uh, he says I'm going to return. I'll come back in a few days, and I'll get my money back. So he goes back to the engineer, and he says, uh, I've got amnesia. I I've lost my memories. So the engineer looks at him for a second. He pulls a small bottle out of his drawer, and the, the doctor Gas, he says, hold on. He said, that's gasoline. He said, ah, good news. You've got your memory back. <laughs> he said, you can pay 50 bucks to the cashier out front. <laughs> so the doctor went home angrier than ever. But still, he wanted to stump the engineer. So after some thought, he went back to the engineer's office a few weeks later, confident that he would get his money back. He says, hey, I think I've lost my eyesight. He said, it's, it's been getting blurry and I can't read as much as I want anymore. And the engineer, he sighs. He says, uh, he says oh, wow, I, I, I don't think I, I have the medicine for that. I, I don't think I can heal you. He says, but here, you can take this $100. So the, the doctor took the bill in hand and looks at him. He says, hold on a second. This is a 50. <laughs> said, perfect. The engineer checked it. He said, you've got your vision back. You can pay 50 bucks to the <laughs> So I want to tell you another one. So there's a, there's an old couple uh, that, that talks to their doctor about memory loss, and the doctor suggests to write things down, right? A lot of us, we carry notebooks, pads, and things like that. It's a common thing. So one day, both of them sitting on the couch, uh, the, the grandma, she asked for a bowl of ice cream. He said, come right up. So grandpa says, he says, he slowly is getting onto his feet, and he, uh, he starts heading towards the kitchen, and grandma looks at him, and she says, aren't you going to write that down? He said, write what down? Of course not. I can remember a bowl of ice cream. So grandma then, uh, she requests to have one scoop of vanilla and one scoop of chocolate. Grandpa says, yes. He says, uh, she says to him, says, aren't you gonna write that down? Surely you're gonna write this one down, right? He says, no, he says, one scoop of chocolate, one scoop of vanilla. He said, e this is easy to remember, I, I got this one. So feeling testy, grandma, she finishes her order with whipped cream, fudge, and cherry on top. She says, surely you're gonna write all that down. He looks at her and he says, did you take me for a fool? Come on, woman. 
I said, I can remember this fine. He said, it's vanilla, chocolate, whipped cream, fudge, and a cherry. I'll be back in a few. So Grandma waits for about 15 minutes, and she hears the, the clanging of pots and pans and whatnot in the kitchen. She starts to smell bacon. She hears a sizzle on the stove. And finally, Gramps returns with a plate of bacon and eggs. And Grandma takes one look at the plate. She looks at him. One look at the plate. Looks at him. She stares at him with sympathy and pity in her eyes. She sighs, and she says, see, I told you to write things down. You forgot my toast. <laughs> so, I'm a fan of cheesy jokes if you can't tell. So, you're probably sitting here wondering why on earth is this man telling jokes, right? Um, my primary role, our primary role as brothers and sisters in Christ, as preachers, as pastors, as it doesn't matter what it is, if you are a believer, in Christ, if you are a bought and paid for child of the risen King, our primary roles kind of fit into three groups, right? It's to remind us of who Jesus is, right? To remind us of what Jesus has done for us, and to remind us of who God's Word says we are. Over and over again, if people come to you with problems, right, you don't have to give them this list of things that they can do. You don't have to be the guy that says, all right, step one, step two, step three. Right? I'm not saying to hold it back. If you know how to help somebody fix a problem, help them fix a problem, period. Right? But our job is to tell each other how good our God is, Amen. is to remind each other of what he's done and who he is. Right? And in so doing, we also are, are partially responsible, if, if not mostly responsible, for reminding each other who we are. Right? So, so I'm not going to preach anything new to you. I'm not a fancy guy. I'm not a fancy preacher. I, I, God's given me a handful of things that I get, and I don't get them completely, but one of them is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's primarily what I'm going to preach this morning. Amen. We, that's the key word here, we are forgetful, we are rebellious, and stiff-necked people. Amen. It says this at the beginning of the book, all the way through. That's why it repeats the same themes over and over and over again. We, again, we, the key word here, need reminding of these things more than any of us would like or might even think. And so, so that's, that's what I'm here to do. I want to preach the gospel of Christ and I want to remind us of who we are, of who God's word says we are. So I want for us to address a, a few questions. One, what is salvation, right? And in a room full of believers, this is a relatively easy topic. Most of us know this, but we're going to go through it again anyways. Question number two, what does this paid debt look like? And three, how does this define us? So John chapter three. I should have told you all this to begin with. The majority of the text that we're going to read is in John chapter three and in first John chapter three. <clears throat> But in John chapter 3, verse 14, I'm a King James guy, by the way. Please don't be mad at me. You can, you can yell at me after this is all over with. Moses warned me. So just, I, I like it. It's what I grew up reading. So uh, if I do need to slow down, or I will explain some things that, that aren't exactly very clear. So, uh, But in, in John chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him, this is verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This word perish also translates as far as Greek is concerned, uh, same word as lost. It's uh, an, another way to put it is destroyed. Verse number 16, this is one that most of us should be familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish or, or be lost or be destroyed, but have everlasting life. Amen. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. This, this word condemn also translates pretty well to judge the world, right? right. God didn't send his son, uh, 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 God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. It's God's will that we are not to be judged, but that we are to be saved from this judgment, right? The judgment that brings death. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for a second. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all that you do for us. 
Lord, you are so good to us. Thank you that your will is that we would be saved and not lost, not destroyed, not perished, Lord. That we find everlasting life in you. Lord, I ask that if there be anybody here or anybody that's watching online that doesn't know who you are, I ask that you soften their hearts to the need of a Savior. Lord, I ask that if, if, if for every single one of us that are here, believer or non-believer, that every one of us recognize the need of your salvation from moment to moment, day to day, week to week, that every moment of our life that we depend upon you desperately. Lord, we need you. Lord, thank you that we're here. Thank you that you are here. I ask that you have your way today. I ask that every single one of us walk away from this place differently. Not because of anything that I've said or the songs that are here. Because of you. Because we get to see you. Because we get to know you. Because we get closer to you. You are so good to us, Lord. Lord we love you. We trust you. And we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 So I, I'm, uh, before I, I jump too far into this, I, I believe uh, there's, there's some things that, that God gets blamed for that he's uh, responsible for, and there's some things that he doesn't, or that he gets blamed for that he's got nothing to do with, right? Like, he's in complete and total control. I'm not trying to argue that point, it, even if it is a yes or a no, but we start with the poem about I am, right? That it, it, we're going to end all of this today with who we are, but it starts with who he is. That's, right. Amen. That's the very first step. So let's look at question number one that I posed a little bit ago. What is salvation? I'm going to read all of John chapter 3. <coughs> Bear with me. I told you earlier I'm not a fancy guy. God's word says that his word won't return void. He doesn't have the same promise for my words. So uh, <laughs> if, if I can, I'm going to spend the majority of my time reading scripture. Amen. Um, not so much that you, I lose, you know, your attention or whatever. We'll, we'll get there, right? right? Amen. So uh, John chapter 3, he says, uh, there was a man of the Pharisees. This story is important, uh, by the way. Uh, we're going to get to the part that's important for us, but the things that lead up to it are also important. So um, in verse number 1, he says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, that's, that's a, a word of respect. Sometimes we translate it as teacher, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean teacher. It means honorable one or something like that. It's, uh, it, but it's, a, it's, uh, uh, it, it's not a title. It's more of like a pat on the back, right? Uh, says, so he says, Rabbi, he says, uh, we know that thou art a teacher come from God because no man can do miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, this means truly, truly. Um, for me personally, anytime I see those two words together, I almost look for Jesus to be sarcastic. It's coming. So it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God, is what it says. Um, Nicodemus said unto him, he says, uh, he says, How can a man be born when he's old? He said, can he enter into the womb, to uh, enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, he said, this is partially where the sarcasm comes in. He says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. He's hanging on to the wrong parts of the story, right? That's what Nicodemus is. He says, the wind bloweth where it listeth. The, the wind comes from, from different places and it goes different places, right? You hear, you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it comes from, right? Uh, and, and, and whether it goes, right? Wherever it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. He's telling you, you're grabbing the wrong points here. So Nicodemus, he says, uh, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Remember me telling you about sarcasm? <coughs> they can't, all right? He says, Ver Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know. He's saying, I I've told you what I know, right? We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. Mm -hmm. I've told you what we've seen and what we know, mm -hmm. and you don't, you're not paying attention to it. <laughs> He said, if I, verse number 12, if I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? He says, you're not, you're, you're grabbing the wrong points. You're trying to figure out the background stuff, and I just need you to understand that you've got to be saved. Right. Verse number 13, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, 
but he that comes down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Verse number 14, this is where we started earlier. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be, must be lifted up. He's prophesying right here. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse number 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Praise God. Thank you, Amen. Jesus. Right? Amen. Number 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world or to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse number 18, he that believeth in him is not condemned or judged. Right? Right? But he that believeth not is condemned or judged already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. This is the, the judgment. That light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Right? The, the folks that are not said just to, just to group that together, right? The condemned, the judge, they don't want the light because they're, they know that, that their deeds are going to be brought to light. And those that are saved, it's the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Let me read in 1 Corinthians. There's, there's a ton of scripture that I'm going to read, but the bulk of it is John chapter 3 and 1 John chapter 3. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. This is Paul talking to the church of Corinth. He says, Which also ye receive, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse number three, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. If you look at that phrase, according to the scriptures, this is prophesied about in the Old Testament. I, Isaiah paints a terrible pictures using the word literally like uh, of what sin and crucifixion looks like we'll, we'll get to that in a minute but but first Corinthians 15 that, that's a, a good little summary of it right that just to wrap that up he says uh, how the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day that's a, just a short simple little little summary so let me break the gospel down for you I, I didn't come up with this but uh, I think what they call it an acronym right where the, the every letter in the word stands for something so uh, this is uh, for G. God created us to be with him. The whole Bible points to this, by the way. Um, oh, our sins separated us from God. And they, they still will do the same thing, by the way. S, sins cannot be removed by good deeds. There's no amount of being a good person, right, that can do this. The only thing capable of removing sin is is the blood of the lamb and we must be covered in his Hallelujah. sacrifice. D, paying the price for our sins, Jesus died and rose again. Hallelujah, praise God. Our God is not dead, he's surely alive, right? One of my favorite days is whenever the girls came back up from, uh, from Sunday school and Charlotte, she's, she's singing, God's not dead, he's surely alive. You picture a four-year-old singing this. It, I, I live up. It's good. It's a good day. Uh, e, everyone who trusts in Jesus alone has eternal life. Romans 10, 9 says uh, that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There's a lot of churches, a lot of different denominations that will complicate salvation. It's it's not complicated. Nicodemus in the story we read earlier, he's like, wait a minute, I don't know what's going on in the background. How is this working? He's like, you're, you're missing it. You're missing the point. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead. According to Romans 10, 9, that is the formula. Mm -hmm. L, life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. 
Amen. What we've known up to this point uh, of, of knowing Christ, if you're not saved, right? What we, what we know up to that point is, is death. Literally, it's death. Right. So I'm going to read a few more scriptures for good measure. Romans 6.23, it says, uh, uh, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look, we, we've been working towards a, a reward of death. Like we've been investing in it. We've invested our time, our energy, our, our, our lives into this. And according to Romans 9.22, it says that we are objects of wrath. This, this is nuts to me, right? Romans 9.22, uh, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? Praise God. The next verse, 923, it says we've been made objects of mercy. Right? Amen, right? Like, I'm, I'm so glad I don't have to pay for the sins, right? <laughs> Romans 923, he says, uh, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Look, we deserve God's wrath, but our, our debt has been paid. Our debt's been paid by Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, right? There's nothing we can do to deserve this. And that's, that's beautiful. There's no amount of work we can do. There, nothing. Literally nothing. <coughs> Romans 5, 8, he says, uh, uh, but, God can, uh, excuse me. but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ knew that I would be an embarrassment. Christ knew the garbage, the, the shame and the guilt that I would bring. And he still said, you are mine. Amen. Amen is right. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Right? The, the law brings death. There's none, of, there's none of us. It doesn't matter how hard we try that can live out the law and not break it. And, and, and not just that, before I get too far ahead of myself, if we break one portion of the law, we're guilty of the whole thing. It's not like, it's not like you just sped a little bit, right? Like to use speeding tickets as the example, right? Well, you're only going five miles an hour over. We're going to give you, you know, a $100 ticket, right? No, you sped five miles an hour, and so they are going to throw everything that the judicial system has at you to compare it to, it, right? They would convict you of the, the same thing, the same equality as murder, right? It's the same exact thing. If you break one portion of the law, you're guilty of the whole thing. But glory to God, right? Jesus Christ is the one who bore that whole weight. And because we believed in him, because we call him Lord, because we know who he is and that he saved us, we don't have to pay this debt anymore. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Right? So let me continue in Galatians 3, uh, verse number 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Amen. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. It's really hard to wrap my head around sometimes Christ being called a curse. God's word is God's word, though, right? Amen. It says that if he's hung on a tree, he's a curse. He bore our curses, our iniquities, our sin. Let me, let me, let me keep reading. Verse number 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I don't want to get into the blessing of Abraham today, maybe another day. But God's good to us. Let's put it that way, all right? But clearly, I've been eating. <laughs> so, um, Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, number five, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, you are saved. Yes. Hey. Colossians 2, 13 and 14, and you being dead in your sins. This is a different book, a whole different book. It says the same exact things, but, but you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcised of the flesh, of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Somebody say all. all. You know what all means? All. It's a mathematical term. It means all of it, right? 
Praise God. I'm not a math whiz, but I like the word all. So It's short. It is, right? And it's, and it's easy to get. It means the whole thing. Global. Right? Global. Verse number 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, which basically meaning that it stood against us and, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Amen. Our sins were paid for there. So, so let, let, me, let me explain this. Uh, this is question number two. What does this paid debt look like? And I want to break it down into to two parts. I want to talk about what he got and I want to talk about what we got, right? James chapter 1. Am I speaking too fast, by the way? Uh, I have to look at my wife every once in a while and she gives me this um, So in, in other sermons, I've tried to, to speak more for me and less from God's word. It doesn't work out, by the way. If you ever got to preach, it's... It's stick with God's word uh, Amen. as much as you possibly can. And so uh, she would get upset with me because I read too much. I'd be looking down at this. I, I got excuses. Though. I'm reading the Bible. This is what I got today. So uh, James chapter 1. This is, again, uh, what the paid debt looks like, what he got. James chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, 14 and 15 is what we're going to read. But every man is tempted that he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. To, to put this into simpler terms. Uh, the, if you don't like carrots, the devil's not going to wag a carrot in front of your face. Right. You see what I'm saying? He's going to use something that, that you like, and it's going to be your fault, our fault, my fault, that I chased after this thing that the devil just happened to know that I liked. Verse number 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Sin, when it's played out, starting with temptation all the way through to the end, brings death. It might just start with spiritual death or financial death, but ultimately it will end up with us being in hell. I've changed my mind since you and I talked. I've read my Bible a little bit, by the way. So Moses and I talked the other day, and um, he pointed out a couple things in Scripture. I love you, brother. So uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 1. Let's look at... Uh, Verse number two, and then we're going to skip down to five and six. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. This is Isaiah saying, shut up and listen. <laughs> I have nourished and brought, this is God speaking now. This is the second half of that sentence. He says, uh, and I have, it says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Verse number five. You can almost see the sympathy, the, the heartache in God's words here. He says, why should you be stricken anymore? He follows that up with, you will revolt more and more. He's not talking about the unsaved. He's talking about his kids. And then he says, the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the, the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness. And he says, there's nothing that's right. And then he says, but, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They've not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ornament. Now let's compare that with, with what Isaiah chapter 52 says. Verse number 13, he says, Behold, my, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled. Extolled is a fancy word for highly praised. And be very high. That sounds pretty good, right? Verse number 14, it says, And many were astonished at thee. That's King James for astonished. And many were astonished at him. His visage the way that he looked was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. He's saying that he was beaten and bruised so badly that he didn't look like a man anymore. When I said that, that Isaiah paints a terrible picture of what, of what sin looks like, this is what I'm talking about. 
So I, I want to read a quote to you. This is from a book called Bought with Blood, The Divine Exchange at the Cross. It's written by a guy by the name of Derek Prince. And, and he compares the two, these two passages. Uh, and he says, uh, Jesus' physical form was so marred that he lost the appearance of a human being. From the crown of his head to the soles of his feet were nothing but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Why was his appearance disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness? Because that is the outworking of rebellion. When rebellion is played out, that's what it looks like. In one vivid picture, God conveys to us the fact that on the cross, Jesus bore our rebellion and all its evil consequences. Don't believe pretty religious pictures about the crucifixion. These are my words now. They are a lie. Crucifixion consisted of, of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. The wounds were open and they were septic. Why? Because the rebellion of us all were visited on him. It wasn't just my sins. It was the sins of all of us. The next time that you and I attempt to rebel, we know that it's going to happen, right? I pray that God gives us a picture of the end of this rebellion. Yeah. Jesus, as the last Adam, took that rebellion, died, and was buried with it. He rose again. Praise God. He rose as the second man, the head of a new creation. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to say this with me. On the cross, on the cross, on the cross. Jesus, bore Jesus bore our rebellion, our rebellion and, all and all its evil, its evil consequences. consequences. If you really believe what you just said, you have one more thing to say. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Thank you. Lord Jesus. So, so that, that's what he got out of this, right? So, so uh, here's what we got. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, uh, sounds like a lot of two paragraphs, right? Uh, and you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. This is uh, uh, Paul setting the stage of who we were, right? Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that, we, that, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Number three, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the, the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. He uses that phrase again. A little differently worded, but it's the same thing. Objects of wrath, children of wrath, right? Verse number four, one of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible. But God. Amen. Right? right? But God. It, whatever follows after that is going to be good. So, so, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you were saved. Number six, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Number seven, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kingdom toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. Amen. Verse number nine, not of works, lest any man should boast. Number 10, I want you to pay close attention to this. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should work and walk in them. Sorry. Let me read that again. Verse number 10. For we are his workmanship. Right? It's all his doing. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You see that? We're, we're saved by grace, but what, why are we saved? To do his work. Right? That's why we're saved. Let me be clear. Works are not going to get you to heaven. It doesn't matter what you do. It, 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 that's, that's not the key. But, but Christ living inside of us, right? The Holy Spirit calling a sinner's heart its home should produce something. 
And not, not, because, not because you're forced into doing it, not because a, a preacher or a pastor stands up here and yells at you and tells you that you've got to do it, right? Please don't take my, my yelling as, a, as an anger, but as a, an excitement that, that, that God lives in us and has chosen us to do things. And, and because of this, there is automatically a response that comes out of it, right? Sins start to fall away. Good works start to be something that's produced, right? Not because... He has said you have to do this, but because he's chosen us and we're different because he lives in us. James is also one of my favorite chapters. God being my helper, one day I'll, pray, I'll, I'll preach James with you. It's, it's hard to deal with, but it, it, every time I read it it's, it, it's good. So, I'm a fan of application, right? We've gotten through explanation portion. Let's, let's look at application. I don't ever want to walk away from a, a pulpit, a platform, or a group of folks that are wanting to hear from God without explaining a couple of things that, that we can do, that we should do, right? First John chapter 3. How long have I been up here? No matter. All right. I'm, you say that. What do y'all say? It doesn't matter. It don't matter. Right? So uh, 1 John chapter 3. I... Um, Am I taking too long, baby? Yeah, no, no. Okay. She's timing me. She's timing me? Okay. I'm not. I, I, I want to be, I always want to be respectful of people's time, right? Like we get together and we, and we praise and we worship and we, we seek after God and we, we want to hear from things, right, from, from God and hear, hear what he's got to say. But uh, at the same time, I, I do want to be respectful of people's time. So I'm, I'm going to do my best. Okay. I, I ought to be good. I ought to be good. So, uh. You guys have, have John Abner's preached here a few times, right? Yeah. His, his and my old pastor, Pastor Bill Cox, uh, which is our, our current pastor, it's his father. Pastor Toby Cox is our pastor. His father is the one that founded our church. He used to say that maybe we could beat the Baptist at a buffet. So, uh, but being that food's out there, uh, we don't have to worry about the line. I'm good. So, uh, First John chapter 3, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Just to be clear, I, I'm into the, 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 the question of how does this define us, right? We've talked about the gospel and what, what it looks like. Now I want to know how does this define who we are. Second part of uh, verse number one, let me start there. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not appear that we shall be, this, this part is a, a little strange, but basically it's saying, uh, let me just read it. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This, let's be clear. There are days that I read the Bible and I feel like I've got it. I'm, I'm there. There are other parts of the Bible that I read and I feel like, like I barely know my Savior. Even as he is pure. That's a hard standard to live up to. But by the grace of God, what? We're saved. Amen. Verse number four. Um, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, transgresseth. That's a, a big word that's hard for me to say. Also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Number six, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. It, going back to there's days that I feel like I got it, and there are moments that I read one sentence, and I'm like, Lord, help me. Without him, I can't do it. Amen. Like this is a difficult standard to live up to. And I know that without Christ, I can't do it. Amen. Amen. Flat across the board, right? Number seven, he says, little children. I think you read one of these last week, Moses. How would you? <laughs> He's like, kids, listen. He's writing to a whole church full of adults. <clears throat> Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. This is a little different picture than we might be used to, right? Um, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the work of the devil. Number nine, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for 
His seed remaineth in him. He's referring to God, right? And he, that can, uh, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Again, man, this is, this is a rough one to get through. But that he's defining who we are and how we are to live. Number 10, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever, he's saying, in, in what I've just said, it becomes very clear to see who is of God and who is not. Let's, 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 let's put it a little more bluntly. Who is of God and who is of the devil? That's, that's what Paul says. Amen. It's not me. And, I, and to be clear, I started with we. Anything that I ever say is not a, a you. If, I, if you ever hear me talk to you in reference to what God's word says, it is a we. There is no difference between me and you. There is no difference between you and Moses or a worship pastor or, or anybody that stands on this platform. There is no super Christians. There are only Christians. Amen. We've all been called to do different things, right? The body works together. Before I get off on a tangent, let me keep going. And number 10, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither that loveth not his brother. We're getting into the hard part. Of the hard thing, right? For the, some of us ain't lovable, right? Like it's just, we just, some of us ain't. There are days that I am and there are days that I am not. As I look at my wife. <laughs> Join the International Public Humanity. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like it's, 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 it's all of us. It's not, it's not a you, it's not a me, it's, a, it's us. It's a we thing, right? Uh, for this is the... For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, for who was of that wicked one? It's saying Cain was of the devil, and he slew his brother. He killed his brother. And wherefore slew he him? That's a fancy word, for a fancy phrase for saying, and why did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteousness. If you see somebody in the faith, God moving in their life, don't you dare be jealous. Amen. Ask them what you can do to help. Ask them what you can do to pray for them. How can I, how can I help you along and rejoice that God is working? Yes. Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. He looked at the righteousness of God being played out in his brother's life and he said, I don't like it. Amen. Verse number 13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He's saying because you, this is his evidence, right? Because you love the unlovable, right? This is a church full of broken people. Every church in the country is. It's not just us. But because, because you love these unlovable people, you have evidence that you pass from death into life. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Lives in death, basically, is what it's saying. Number 15, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Number 16, hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. Let me keep going. But whosoever hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need... And shutteth up his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? He says, when you see somebody that's need and you and you don't do anything about it, he's not even talking about the sick, the widows, and the orphans. He's talking about folks that he called brother. Verse number 18, my little children, there it goes again. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Deed. Works. Right? Again, by grace you were saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But he's saying that something is produced. Amen. Number 19, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Number 21, beloved, if, your heart if, if our heart condemn us not, that we have confidence toward God. Or then we have confidence toward God. Number 22, and whatsoever we ask, we receive in him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Number 23, and this is his commandment, 
that we should believe on the name of the Son of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. And He gave us this commandment. Number 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. I beg you to read John chapter 3 and 1 John chapter 3 again. 1 John chapter 3 is a, it's a hard look, man. It's a, it's a hard thing to stare at and, and recognize what God has called us out of and into. Because it was easier to live for the world. When I first preached, I can remember looking at everybody. And I used to used to sing in bars and nightclubs. And it is easier to speak to a room full of drunk folks than it is to a room full of believers. <laughs> they judge you way less. Yeah. <laughs> right, and they're tone deaf, right? <laughs> Seven shots in, I'm doing great. <laughs> but it, it's hard for us to look at God's word and know that change is not only expected, right? It is, it is something that is produced. I, I, I said this to our, our church a few weeks ago. Like you say that you don't cuss, you don't drink, that you don't smoke anymore, that's, that's great. Praise God, right? That's the beginning. Amen. Right? Those are the easy things for us to get past. Mm -hmm. To work with each other, unlovable people, by human standards, let's be clear, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard to do what it is that God's word says we are supposed to do. It's hard to, to look at this and go, man, I, I fall short of this glory. Over and over. There's not enough time for me to repeat over <laughs> to get to the to the point of it, it being real. But God, again, right? But his grace, his kindness, and his mercy, his forgiveness, right? He, he knew that I would do the stupid things that I do. Amen. He knew that I would fall short over and over again. And he said, you are mine. And he's my dad. He's my father, right? My favorite term for him in the Bible is Abba. Oh, yeah. It means daddy. It means daddy. It's, that's the closest translation that we have. It's not the old man waiting for you to step on his lawn so he can yell at you. Right? It's the one that's standing there knowing that you're going to fail and knowing that you're going to fall that says, I'll be right here with you. Here, let me, let me take your hand, man. Let's stand back up. Let's go with this again. Praise God is right. Glory to God, man, that he calls us his. That God Almighty knew who we, like, I don't know about y'all, when, whenever I, I came back to God, like, I needed him. Yeah. I needed to be saved, right? It, 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 like, I ain't always been a nice guy. Let's just put it plain and simple. But glory to God. It is not me. It is not anything that I've done. It's the, the things that he has produced. You Amen. stand in light long enough. You stand in the sun, you get a tan. It's, it's a byproduct. There's nothing that can be done about it, right? Amen, brother. So, let's move on to identity politics, right? Now, this is a topic that's easy for right? Because we're going to get good in a minute. So, uh, identity politics. I, uh, we live in a time where, where identity is the thing, right? You want to live in this little box, right? Everybody wants to define who they are by what they do and the things that they got going on. I have a, a relative that... Uh, she calls herself a, a depressed lesbian. I, I, I don't want to get into right, wrong, left, or right there. But if there's anything that you're going to define yourself as, why is that the one? It doesn't make sense. It's, it's like me going, hi, I'm Aaron. I'm a heterosexual father. What? It's weird. It's super weird. So, yes. I am a heterosexual male. I am a father, right? Like, I, I, they, these are characteristics. I'm a carpenter, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dad. I'm a preacher. I'm a singer. I'm a songwriter. I'm a, all of these things. But they do not define me. And there's no list that you can come up with that isn't out of God's word that defines you. 
It doesn't matter what your illness is or what's going on in your head. There ain't a single person that you're ever going to meet that doesn't have some kind of mental illness. We are messed up people. Remember when you talk about a room full of broken folks? Every single one of us got problems that we're facing or issues that we've not been able to overcome. Even with God beside us going, man, I can bring you out of this. We choose to sit in the dumbest things. We are. We're, going back to the beginning, we are rebellious, stiff-necked, forgetful people. <clears throat> I also want to remind you of what my job is and your job is, is to remind each other of who God is, what he's done, and who we are. So I'm going to spout off a list of things, and I'm going to give scriptural reference to it. There's not enough time. This is a quote-unquote short list. By short list, I mean it's not everything that the Bible says about this, right? I printed out this list. It's at the table out front if you'd like a copy of it so you can be as the Bereans do, right, and go and, and find out in God's word if what I'm saying is true, this list is there. This is as Bible-believing, blood-bought, born-again, children of the Most High God. Come on. This is what the Bible says about who we are. According to John chapter 1, verse 12, I am a child of God. Yeah. According to John chapter 15, verse 5, he says, I am a branch of the true vine and a conduit of Christ's life. According to John 15, 15, I am a friend of Jesus. According to Romans 3, 24, I have been justified and redeemed. According to Romans 6, 6, the old self was crucified with Christ, and I am no longer a slave to sin. Romans 8, 1 says, I will not be condemned by God. Verse, uh, Romans 8, 2, it says, I have been set free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 17 says, as a child of God, I am a fellow heir with Christ. Amen. Meaning that I don't have to pay the debt that I owe. Meaning that Christ has chosen me and not just, not just said, come on, man, come and live in my house. He said, you are my child. And, you, and therefore, as children of the king, we are what? Heirs. Heirs. Right? All right, let me keep going. There's some of these things, man, you can hang on to and just keep on with it, right? Uh, Romans, uh, or that's one I just read. Romans 15, 7, I have been accepted by Christ. Glory to God. Amen. According to 1 Corinthians 1, 2, according to Ephesians 1, 1, Philippians 1, 1, and Colossians 1, 2. How many times do you skip over the intro for Paul? It's just, it's hard to get through. It's like, dear Lord, Paul, shut up and get to what you got to talk about. But there's, there's good stuff there. According to all four of those, every letter that he writes just about, he calls them saints. According to all of those scriptures, I have been called to be a saint. Even the people he's writing to that need correction, he calls them saints. Or says you're called to be a saint, get out of the garbage you're in. 1 Corinthians 1.30, in Christ Jesus I have wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. According to 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. According to 1 Corinthians 6.17, I am joined to the Lord and am one, and I'm one spirit with him. According to 2 Corinthians 2.14, God leads me in the triumph and knowledge of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.14, the hardening of my mind has been removed. Yes. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5.17, I am a new creature in Christ. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I have become the righteousness of God in Christ. Right, righteousness, if we look at the examples that were given, this is, this is just, I'm a fan of seeing what the word means by the actions that are played out in God's word, right? Like it gives me a better wrap my head around at moment. If you look at uh, Abraham, his righteousness was his faith being played out. And so then you look at that and you go, I have become the righteousness or the faith played out of God in Christ. I don't fully get it. I don't fully understand it. But glory to God, that's what his word says. Amen. So whatever it is, I'll take it. <laughs> so Galatians 3, 8, or 3.28 says, I have been made one with all who are in Christ Jesus. We are the body. Galatians 4, 7 says, I'm no longer a slave, but a child and an heir. Galatians 5, 1 says, I have been set free in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 says, I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. 
Ephesians 1, 4 says, I am chosen, holy, and blameless before God. Ephesians 1, 7 says, I am redeemed and forgiven by the grace of Christ. Ephesians 1, 10 through 11 says, I have been predestined by God to obtain an inheritance. I don't want to get into predestination or anything. Just, it's, that's, that's a time for us to sit down and, and, and we'll, we'll wade through it another day, right? But that's what it says. I, don't blame me. It's God's word. Ephesians 1, 13 says, I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5, it says, because of God's mercy and love, I've been made alive with Christ. Ephesians 2, 6 says, I'm seated in the heavenly places with Christ. Ephesians 2, 10, I am God's workmanship created to produce good works. Mm. Ephesians 2, 13, I have spit all over my hot <laughs> Right? It's got a screen protector, I'm right? sure. Right? Wipe it off later. I, Ephesians 2.13, I have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 3.6 and 5.30 says, I am a member of Christ's body and a partaker of his promise. Ephesians 3.12 says, I have boldness and confident access to God through faith in Christ. Ephesians 4.24 says, My new self is righteous and holy. Again, there are days that I sit in that box and I go, Amen, I'm righteous and holy. And then you go back and you read something like 1 John chapter 3 and you're like, I don't know. But God's <laughs> word says it. God's word says this, right? Because of his grace and kindness and mercy, his forgiveness, right? I have been made righteous and holy. Ephesians 5, 8, I was formerly darkness, but now I'm light in the Lord. Philippians 3, 20, I am a citizen of heaven. Philippians 4, 7 says, the peace of God guards my, guards my heart and mind. Philippians 4, 19 says, God supplies all my needs. Yeah. Colossians 2, 10 says, I've been made complete in Christ. Colossians 3, 1 says, I have been raised up with Christ. Colossians 3, 3 says, my life is hidden with Christ in God. Uh, Excuse me. Colossians 3, 4 says, Christ is my life, and I will be revealed with him in glory. Colossians 3, 12 says, I have been chosen of God, and am holy and beloved. Amen. 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 First Thessalonians 1, 4 says, God loves me and has chosen me. Yeah. You are. Thank you, Jesus is right. The God Almighty stands over, and there's parts of the Bible that talk about him singing over us. It's beautiful to think that, that, that God Almighty, the Lord of heaven and earth, the one that sits above everything, the one that created all of this and still loves us enough that he sings over us. Picture it like a, a mom or a dad singing to their child that's heartbroken or, or hurt or or crying, or hungry, or, or, or they got colic, right? You just picture a baby that, that, that doesn't know what's going on and doesn't know how to fix it, and God Almighty is standing there singing over top of it, right? Picture it as a child that's done right. Picture it as a child that's done good things, and God is rejoicing over his children and his creation, the work of his hands, doing his work. Amen. This is who God's word says we are. And God being my helper, I'll get another chance to talk to you about some of these things, right? That we'll get to wade through this. It's not because of anything that we've done, anything that I've done to deserve it. The only thing, this is a John Abner line. This is something that, that he's the one who, I don't know who he got it from. You can ask him one day, but I got it from John. The only thing that I can bring to the table is my sin, my guilt, my shame. Nothing else do I get to bring to this table, to this exchange. And he said, that works, man, just give it here. Let me take it. And then for me to think that that's worthy, like that that's a worthwhile exchange for him, he lost out. Right? We're the clear winners in this. Glory to God, he loves us, man. Amen. Amen. And this defines us. Let me wrap this up. I want to read a, a few scriptures and then we'll be done. James chapter 1, verse 21. He says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That superfluity of, of naughtiness means the abundance of wickedness. 
and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Not my words, God's word. God's word is the one that can do this. God is the one that can save souls. There's nothing that I can do. There's no, I can't convince you of a need for a savior, even if you are a bought and paid for child of God. Verse number 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I've told you who God's word says you are. Don't walk away from here without remembering this. Number 23, it says, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. Can you imagine looking in the mirror and... As soon as you turn around, you forget who you are. God's word is clearly defined who we are. Remember it. And not just that, but let it change who you are. Even as a believer, right? Like I'm talking to a room full of folks that, that, that believe in, in God as their Savior. I'm not trying to convince somebody who's not saved that they need to say this. We are in. We're brothers and sisters. Don't forget who you are, who God's word has said you are. Verse number 24, for, for he, uh, I already did that one. And I straightway forgets what manner of man he was. Number 25, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, works. Here's that funny word again. This man shall be blessed in his deed. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Again, it's talking about a mirror. This is the kind of the opposite of what James is talking about. He says, again, open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord and changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. One of them talks about how we can look in the mirror and forget what God has said about us and who we are. And the other one says, says it's okay, you can do this. You're going to look in the mirror. You're going to see your reflection. You're going to see God in the mirror. And you're going, not literally, just be very clear. I'm not saying that you're God. <laughs> it's not that kind of preacher, right? I just, it, it, God's word doesn't say that. So from the same image, right? We're, we're to look more and more like him. We are, we're to be transformed from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. There's nothing you can do about it, but just because you've stood in the sun, you're going to get a sun tan. Amen. Just because God's spirit dwells inside of you, things will be different. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus is right. 2 Corinthians 5.17 he says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Amen. And behold, all, say it with me, all, all things are become new. Listen to me. This is the last thing I got to say. Because of our encounter or encounters with Jesus Christ, because of us changing from glory to glory, our hearts will be turned away from sin towards him yeah. showing his love to the world everything should be different everything should be different are you going to struggle you better believe it like i go back to what i said earlier it was easier to live for the world people that come to god expecting for everything to be made different are being set up to fail because it's hard it's difficult to do it's difficult to love people that are hard to love. It's difficult just to do what God's word says we are to do and what God's word says we are, right? We, it's like I can't live up to these standards. Without God, I'm nothing. John, John Abner, again, there's nothing. It's out, he, he took it out of the Bible. There's nothing good in me. It's outside of Christ. That's, right. That's it. That's all I got. Last statement. Behold. Things are new. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Oh, Lord, you are so good to us. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you that all things are made new. That you don't leave us in the shape that you found us. But as a, a loving father, as, a, as our friend and our savior, you help us stand back up. 
that you never leave us alone, that you never forsake us, that no matter how many times we fail, that you are right there. Again, with open arms. That you forgive us of our sins, that you've, you've separated us from darkness, that you've pulled us out of this wickedness. And I, I ask that we leave this place different. Again, not because of anything that I've said, but because of what your word says. Because you're good to us. Because you're with us. Lord, I ask that as we leave this place, that your word will ring out in our heads like a bell. That everything that the enemy throws at us over this next week, over the course of the rest of our lives, that we can remember. Your word says that your Holy Spirit will remind us of what your word says. And all we got to do is bring it up to the devil. And no matter what he throws at us, that your word is bigger, your word is greater, that, that you are stronger, Lord. That you're with us. Lord, man, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this place. I thank you that you're with us. Oh, have your way with us, Lord. Let us be different because of you. Lord, we love you, we trust you, and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name.